So welcome everyone again. Good morning, afternoon, possibly evening, wherever you are, welcome to Rayfest, our online festival celebrating women of spirit. Thank you so much for joining us from around the world. I'm your host, Saima Daya, and together with Fatima Ashraf, we are the co-creators of Ray of God. Ray seeks to share feminine spiritual wisdom to help realize God in all ways and to align with justice, truth, and beauty. The energetic state of the feminine is our guiding principle and holds our intention. And we believe that all genders hold the feminine and the masculine within themselves. While we are women-led and women-centered, we welcome and encourage all genders to join us in a safe, inclusive space, God willing. Ray does not seek to present a voice of expertise. We see ourselves as travelers along the way and learning with each step. Our ideas are constantly evolving and we hope you will join us on this journey to deeper consciousness. The aim of the festival this year is to encounter, embody and embrace. And our wonderful contributors will be speaking to the broad theme of her body. What is possible when we reconnect with our bodies and begin again to see them and the earth from which they're formed as sacred, regenerative, and holding wisdom. We're blessed to be welcoming over the course of this weekend a diverse array of intergenerational, interspiritual contributors, religious leaders, spiritual teachers, activists, academics, creatives, and so much more. And this weekend is marked by Samhain, the midway point between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. It's a time to honour the saints and we hold in our awareness that this weekend there will be many friends around the world in ceremony and prayer at the same time that our festival is unfolding. And we have live captions available for each session. You can access them by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which is alongside your other options. And there's a little up arrow, you just click on that and enable subtitles. So in this heart to heart session, we'll be asking our contributors to speak to the theme and we welcome your questions to be submitted to the chat function. You can submit them to myself as host and then toward the end of the session, we'll also be opening up the chat so that you can share more if you wish. Please do feel free to ask whatever comes to your heart. Just being mindful that our contributors are also on a journey like each of us and deserve our love and respect and being willing to share from their hearts in such an open forum. So I'd like to introduce our Spiriting Shiros for today's session. We begin with Dr. Justine Afro Huxley, who is the CEO of St. Ethelberger's Centre for Reconciliation and Peace in London. St. Ethelberger's mission is to inspire people to bridge our divisions and love the earth and to recognize the links between those two most urgent tasks. Justine's work centers on building inner and outer resilience for times of social and ecological breakdown. She's a follower of the Sufi tradition and has been leading meditation and dream work groups for many years. Justine has a PhD in psychology and she's the editor of Generation Y, Spirituality and Social Change, which is published by Jessica Kingsley. It's a collection of stories about how the younger generation are reinventing spirituality for a time of global crisis. A beautiful book. And we also have wonderful Leila Yagiela, who's rejoining us from last year. Leila is a cultural anthropologist and a research assistant in studies of religion at the Chair for Contemporary Cultures of Islam at Beirut University in Germany. She's also a chairperson of the Lib EV an organization of progressive and inclusive Muslims of Germany. She's a fellow of the Muslim Institute here in London and a member of the Global Queer Muslims Network. I say here in London, but neither Fatima or I are in London. So here in the UK, let's say, let's not make London the centre. <laughs> Apologies for those of you who are in London. <laughs> so Leila's academic work focuses on questions of orthodoxy and heterodoxy in the Islamic discourses of South and Southeast Asia, as well as on the representation of gender and sexuality within these discourses. 
She's been an activist in the fields of progressive and inclusive Islam for the past few years, and she's held workshops on feminist and trans inclusive approaches to Islam in Germ Germany, the UK, South Africa, and Pakistan. And her new book, Among the Eunuchs, A Muslim Transgender Journey, is due out in December of this year, God willing. Mm. And then we also have the lovely Naima Khan, who's the director of Inclusive Mosque Initiative. She oversees the implementation of um, Inclusive Mosque or IMI's strategy to, to bring radically inclusive intersectional feminist practice to Muslim social justice work. I think a lot of the friends um, during this weekend who are joining have been to at least one, if not many, IMI events. So Leila, uh, sorry, Naima has a background in the philanthropy sector and communication roles in the third sector. And she's a regular contributor to radio shows on topics including feminism, religion, and the arts. Naima was also the program manager for the first MFest UK in 2018. So thank you all lovely, lovely contributors for being with us. Um, so I'm going to open up with a question and it'll be the same for all three of you and um, perhaps Justine could, uh, could open up for us. What does the feminine body mean to you and how do you encounter this relationship? Wow, well, thank you, Sima. And, um, you know, a huge thank you to both you and Fatima to, for including me um, in this wonderful uh, event. Actually, excuse me, I've just been distracted by my image, which has just popped up on the screen again after I thought I'd hidden it. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just change that. That's better. Um, yeah, it's really lovely to be here. And I think, you know, you've crafted such a beautiful weekend. So I feel very honoured to be here. And it's lovely to speak, be speaking with Leila and Naima, who I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, so I think this is a really vital question for our times, you know, the question that you've just asked, Simon, but also all the questions we're working with in this session, because, of course, the way they're beautiful and nourishing questions to work with, but they're also really at the heart of why our world is going so badly wrong and is in such a challenging position right now. So I think it's also very uh, apposite to be talking about these themes on the eve of the COP26 in Glasgow when the whole world's attention is focused on the earth. Um, so for me, um, growing up in a, a female body, um, particularly in adolescence and young adulthood, was really a very challenging thing. It's not easy to be female in this world and I think um, certainly I experienced growing up as being fraught with the dangers and difficulties of navigating a world that really doesn't honour the feminine. And of course, speaking for myself, I also internalised that lack of honour of the feminine. So for me, the journey um, into embracing a, a female body has been a long and actually very challenging one, which has mostly been about um, uncovering layer after layer after layer of family conditioning, life conditioning, societal conditioning and religious conditioning um, and trying to integrate that in myself. But I think, um, you know, it's not been an easy road, but for me, I, I can say now, finally, <laughs> in my later years, that it is beginning to be uh, a doorway into great mystery and revelation and beauty in a way that it really wasn't when I was younger. It was really a source of of darkness and pain um, and you know has become the basis of the spiritual path and the service that I do. Um, so I really hope that possibly by the time I die I might have landed in my female body and really understand her mysteries properly. And um, for me I think you know the one thing that I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about was for me that that journey was really accentuated by um, being involved in spiritual life and you know my sense is that where humanity is is you know between in this liminal space between two huge eras of human evolution and human spiritual consciousness the evolution of spiritual consciousness and that we're coming from this era of duality where the separation of heaven and earth uh, defined how we approached religious life 
And that so I mean, this is less true of Islam, but in many traditions, you know, there was this asceticism or monasticism or retreat and withdrawal from everyday life and this denigration of the body and the feminine and the goal being about transcendence. So this, to my mind, is the old ways, you know, and this this way of doing spiritual life and doing life in general is really past its sell by date and is beginning to destroy us. And there is this need to move on to something else. But when I first came to spiritual life, that was very much the model that I was presented with. And I remember understanding or coming to understand this uh, map of the dimensions of reality that was kind of like a ladder, you know, it would be like earth is down here and then the archetypal realm and then the realm of the soul and then the realm of non-being or emptiness. And then behind that in this formless, unknowable way, absolute truth and that there was this hierarchy and I think I, I would you know being born in the time that we're born and being at the age I am I see my life as spanning these two uh this you know these two consciousnesses the one that's on the way out and the one that's on the way in and my spiritual life has really been a story that has been about going from one world view to the other and so um you know, having come from this place where spirituality was really about rejecting earth and striving for heaven, I can now really see that, you know, or, or experience spirituality differently that, you know, that heaven is here on earth, that it's, it's interwoven with everyday life, it's interwoven with the body, it's interwoven with the earth, that all of those dimensions of reality are not in a hierarchy, they're all interpenetrating and there is no one that is higher or lower than any others. So I really feel like I've come to understand and taste that interexistence and interwovenness of those different levels of reality and can see that there is this deep need for integration, the integration of above and below of the everyday and the spiritual and the integration of the masculine and the feminine. And I feel that the seeds of that integration are all around us being expressed in all kinds of different practices that belong to the future. You know, everything from circular economy to rewilding or to like different, different relationships with our body. Um, so the seeds are everywhere and they're being planted, you know, in our minds, in the world, in different places, in the soil, in our own hearts. But somehow I wonder whether we will get to see the fruition of that new world in our lifetimes, you know, and that maybe there's more falling apart that's needed before the freedom can come for that to come to fruition. So I no longer really expect to see that come to fruition in my own lifetime, but that is the reality that I work for and that I pray for. Um, so for me, this, you know, my relationship with my female body and the female body of the earth is very much bound up in this story of transition from a dualistic frame to an interpenetrating frame. And that is really what I pray for. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. That's, um, I love this idea of shifting eras and consciousness. And I feel like this is the work that seems to be coming out of Ray that it is this, you know, moving from you know, the dualist, dualistic to the interpenetrating. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Naima, would you like to um, speak to the same question? How does the feminine, what does the feminine body mean to you? And how do you encounter this relationship? Sure. Um, thank you first for saying what you said at the beginning about the contributors not being experts any more than the audience because when I when you sent this question I was like oh gosh I could learn so much more from the people at Ray about this than I have to offer on this subject but <clears throat> what I was thinking about um, in terms of the feminine is it's like when I read that question can I put it in the chat would that help people um, what does the feminine body mean to you and how do you encounter this relationship um, I was experiencing like a wave of negativity to the term feminine body because that hasn't been useful to me for such a long time um, and the reason is when I think about, it hasn't been useful to my own understanding of myself for a long time, because when I think about the fact that I existed before I existed in this body and that I will continue to exist after I exist in this body, feminine feels like such a construction and a heavy construction that happened 
way out of my control, something that wasn't that I didn't choose necessarily, um, but that was put on me, potentially by your law, potentially by society. I don't know, but it feels like a very constructed thing that I don't, that I didn't choose, um, and that I have to reckon with while I am in this body. Um, and at the same time, it's really, really useful for me to be able to use that term, feminine or a feminized body, um, to explain my experiences uh, and how I move through the world to other people. So I feel like the term feminine body is useful when I have to explain myself to others, but it's really not at all useful when I have to contemplate who I am with myself. Um, and that's where I feel like there's, I have a bit of a struggle. And I wanted to share something kind of related to that, which was a conversation I had with my lovely housemates. And we were talking about, who are both men, and we were talking about how um, we were taught as kids that our bodies change at very specific times, right? And that's when we're going to notice changes. And it's adolescence, and puberty, it's pregnancy, and menopause. And these are the times when your body, you, you will notice these changes. And how much of a fallacy that was, given that our bodies change all the time, every single day. Um, and, you know, for, for, sorry, Simon talked about the the energetic state of the feminine and I felt like that also has changed every single day of my life and through every period of my life and the idea that I would only notice changes if I got pregnant or if I went through menopause it's just so ludicrous to me now even though these are like very, very much associated with the feminine body but I grew up with a father who had a degenerative illness and he eventually passed away from that I have a mother who had a chronic illness so all of these ways that her you know their bodies exist and have changed over time I feel like it's something I want to remind myself of, that I'm not in a state of feminine change. I'm just in a state of change and will always be. Um, and that, yeah, that I kind of just struggle with with this term a little bit. And also because of the word body. Um, I was reading something by Muna Abdi, who um, was writing about Somali culture and how there isn't really a separate concept, she was saying, between mental health and physical health in Somali culture. There's just health. And I was so pleased to read that because that reminded me that when I think of perhaps my body, my feminine body or my female body, I'm thinking very much in terms of the somatic and what, you know, and I can, t I can kind of separate it from emotional and physical. But maybe I shouldn't be doing that. And that, that is something that I need, I would like to practice stepping out of and stepping into and stepping out of so that I get used to an understanding of feminine body that isn't, even coded in in the constructed way that I've understood it as a as a person that's now you know in my thirties and hasn't experienced menopause yet, but at some point will. And I want to be able to remind myself like this is a change like many other changes, um, but may feel distinct and you may need and want separate things. Um, so I'm trying to kind of step in and out of the term feminine body without tying myself to it because I feel deeply uncomfortable with it. If that's if I'm being really honest, but at the same time it's really useful to me. So I'll stop and uh, maybe we can go to later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naima, for, for being so honest and, and sharing that. Um, I think, you know, when Fatima and I started with Ray, we spent such a long time trying to figure out a definition of what do we mean by the feminine? You know, and for a long time, we spent too much time just kind of holding that, thinking we, we need to define it. We must let people know what we mean. And we just couldn't, like the longer we sat with it, we just found that it's so indefinable and yet there are ways of approaching it. And so we thought, actually, we feel guided to just not give a definition because we want everyone who comes into the space to share what it means for them, because that's 100% the definition in the moment for what the feminine is to that person. And I was recently reading... Um, uh, Dr. Sadia Sheikh's um, uh, book on Ibn Arabi and in that she talks about the difficulty of when you have a term like feminine and masculine people automatically um, and I, I believe wrongly assume it means male and female but really it's these principles and a different way of approaching it might be that feminine equals receptivity and masculine equals um, um, activity but then again, we don't want to be associating it with male and female. So it's the principles and it's kind of unpacking all these terms 
So I'm really grateful that, you, that you've brought that up because this is something I hope that all the contributors will be able to bring to the table. What does it mean for them? And also the difficulties that we've all had, including myself. So thank you so much. Um, Can I just jump in on that? Sorry. Yeah. Because I was working on something this week that really chimes with what you're saying. Um, so Inclusive Mosque, we're developing a feminist imam program. Um, and I was doing a module on how to communicate with the Inclusive Mosque community, how to understand them and what they've been through and how, what should our imams consider when they're communicating with them. And it set me off on this whole rabbit hole journey of trying to figure out, so what was Rasulullah? What was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Who was he communicating to and how was he communicating with them and what was useful to them at that time? And I really feel like the terms feminine and masculine reflect that. They reflect what is useful to us. And, you know, Justin was talking about the different eras. We, might, we will get to an era where these terms maybe are not as useful to us in our communication as they are right now. But, yeah, reflecting what you said, I think that the, the term feminine energy, fem, like the feminine qualities of Allah, they are for us for right now. Um, so we sh I don't think we should shy away from them. But I'm very excited for a time when they, they may not be as useful to us in our communication. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope we can hear more about the Feminist um, Imams program. I know I'm very excited about it, so maybe you can share a little bit more about that later on. Um, Leila Jahan, would you like to um, speak to the question? Yes, very much. First of all, well, thank you very much also, very much for having me here. Such a beautiful space, and I'm already so inspired by what Justine and Naima had to say, and there's a lot for me to think about as well. Um, First of all, a correction, but I'm going to connect it to the issue because it's so typical. You asked me to review my uh, bio, but I didn't do it properly. I was too lazy to do it. I'm not at Bayreuth University anymore. Actually, for quite a while, I'm not. Um, but I have, I have a new uh, job, very fresh right now, uh, since this month. I'm a project coordinator of the uh, it's called Jüdisch Muslimische Kulturtage in Heidelberg. So it's a Jewish Muslim culture festival. Um, and apart from that, I'm doing my freelance work. Um, but yeah, this is so typical of me also. And it's, it, it kind of, it, it relates to this question because I do tend to um, underestimate the physical and the practical a lot in my life, you know, and I'm always like, ah, oh, what is a bio, you know, what is a picture, you know, it's like, I don't, I really don't like bothering with these kind of things. And it doesn't matter whether I work, still work there or not. And, and these, and, and I have a lot of this, yeah, with a lot of tangible things in life, physical things in life, concrete things in life. I have this relationship that I always, underestimate that this this physical embodied um, part of life but I think it may also be related to my experience with with the body and I'm I'm speaking as a transgender woman and of course for me the question of the feminine and or female body has always been a complicated one uh, right from my birth right from when I started to think and be conscious of myself, definitely. Um, I also, I make the distinction between female and feminine and male and masculine. These are different things for me. And I, I, um, I love it. It's interesting that things come back because I, I'm at an event at the Netherlands, in the Netherlands right now. Um, Amina Wadud, who I saw also just entered uh, this space, spoke at that event as well, online, of course, uh, yesterday, and also brought that point up um, that we have to think of masculine and feminine maybe less in relationship to male and female. It's a very um, beautiful and important thought, I think, and yet I also see the problems with that. Um, as, a, as a child, I didn't have a female body, but I was constantly policed. I was constantly bullied for embodying femininity. You know, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you act. These are also aspects of your physicality. Um, and my, my experience of femininity or the feminine body has a lot to do with that. So the, the way how you embody femininity and how that is accepted or not accepted by society, 
what uh, people then assume about your identity or what it means to your own self-expression of identity. Um, and then as a transgender woman, at some point I decided to transition and this, this process of transition is quite fascinating. I think if we think of it as a, as a spiritual journey as well, just, I mean, really the physical process that is, is one of, of bringing out something that's already there. If you, if you think of it, you know, it's, 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 not not only are feminine and masculine interrelated and inter interdependent, but also female and male, even if we take it as very strict categ biological categories, um, they are so much interrelated in our own bodies. You know, the, it's, it's a bit of a populist question, but it brings it out very much, you know, the old question, why do, why do men have nipples, you know? Is also always a bit of a, uh, a mystery. Um, uh, well, the, the simple reason is because we all actually, as in, in our embryonic state, we all had this um, capability to develop in the one direction or in the other direction, depending on which hormones um, are affecting us. And when you go through uh, through the process of, of, of medical transition as a as a trans woman um, that uh, basically goes yeah that, that 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 triggers these same processes it just does it as you know an already born human being than a, an older human being but it's it's not uh, you know the old not politically correct term was sex change um, but you actually do do not change something you bring out something else that is already present in your in your body and i find that um something very significant actually to think about not only for trans people like me for whom this is just part of of our experience of ourselves but for everybody to think of okay it's it's not not only that we all have masculine and feminine aspects but we also very in a very physical sense we all have male and female uh, bodies in a sense they are all inherent in us um, and um, as far as the larger spiritual relationship is concerned to the body i i think um as i said i I unfortunately sometimes tend to underestimate the physicality, the uh, the, the the tangible side of things. Um, but I also think that really a, a body is much more than that precise physical biological thing that we have. I think a body is, I, I think of a body much more as a form, you know. And in, in Islam, we've always had this debate on what, what happens to this body, for example, when we die. And um, while I think uh, other religious traditions have less of a conflict with the idea that, oh, maybe there's just a soul and the soul goes somewhere and the body disappears or something. But the, the Muslim mainstream uh, tradition is very insistent on this idea of physical resurrection actually you know and even even mystics some of the biggest mystics have said yeah they have mystical interpretations of that act of resurrection but then they will always write a disclaimer and say but yet yet there still is physical resurrection so don't accuse me of saying there's no physical resurrection so physical resurrection is a huge huge thing in islam we we very much insist on that, that there will be something actual, a, a body that will be resurrected, it's not just the soul. Um, but then the question is really, what body is that? Because as, as Naima said, our body is constantly changing. The cells that I have with me right now are not the same cells I had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, not to even speak of who I was as a child, for example. What, what is there even that is, remaining you know is there even a continuity there's very very few actually that remains so um 
and Muslim theologians were were aware of that, you know, uh, not not so much on the level of skin cells or something like that, but they were of course aware that human beings are changing throughout their lives, so they needed to find a solution for that. And a lot of, um, especially mystically minded scholars, have pointed out that there is a kind of body, and we keep that body, and this body will also be resurrected, but. This, what we see here, is really just what we consider our body in this world is really just the, the outer layer of that actual body that we have. And the interesting thing is that there are traditions in Islam that point out that this, the, our actual body that will be resurrected can have in paradise whatever form we want to have it. And one of my most favorite and most beloved hadith um, and I may have already quoted it last year during Rayfest because it's so so important to me and I, I quote it again and again is a tradition uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam uh, says it's reported by by Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam that the Prophet said in paradise there's a marketplace and people go there and they take up whatever form they want to have. And it's explicitly said in that hadith, whether it's male or female. And I think that says something about a tradition in Islam, where we can think of the body as something, yes, that we have and that we are resurrected with, but that also exists in a much more fluid way, um, and a much more, uh, yeah, much more soft way than this kind of body that I have in this moment. But again, tomorrow some of these cells will already have disappeared. Some of this hair will have fallen out. And in a couple of years, maybe none of these cells will be there anymore. So um, I, I very much relate to that idea of the body, some kind of other thing that holds me um yeah thank you very much thank you thank you Leila Jan for for sharing um all those aspects I love what you've said about that you know it's bringing out whatever is already there and you know these challenges with the body I love the hadith I think it's something that it needs to be shared widely definitely mm. share it whenever you can um you know i've i've had challenges with my body going from a very uh active way of living in the world to um having a chronic uh, condition which meant i became very still and i felt this change from perhaps a, a masculine active way of being to then moving into the feminine receptive mode of being and again, I think, you know, it's so important to make the distinctions and also say that these are ways of being that anybody can, um, can manifest and everyone has the potentiality within us. Um, so I feel like the next question is kind of connected to this idea of, you know, as we change, you know, every day as we're feeling our way through the world. Um, and, and maybe I could ask Justine again to start us off is, how can we embody the sacred in our lives and to help create more safe spaces, especially especially as female bodies, um, as we move through the world. Thank you, Just. Thank you, Simon, and thank you so much to Leila and Naima for what you contributed. I was I was really fascinated by all of that. Um, yeah, I I re I sort of wrongly read this question the first time and and thought, oh, hang on a minute, I've got me again on the screen. <laughs> Let me just get rid of that. It keeps coming back. Um, gallery view. Thank you. Um, I thought it, I originally heard it as being to do with the creation of sacred space. And then I sort of later looked at it and said, how, how do we embody the sacred in our lives? Which is a, a much more interesting question and, and um, very beautifully phrased. Um, what came to me to start with was just the, that there are a million different ways to do that or a billion different ways to do it. And I was brought, I thought of Jalaluddin Rumi's um, saying that there are as many ways to God as there are breaths of the children of men. Obviously, if he was in this Zoom room, he would have to change that to the breaths of the children of women and men. Um, 
but I love that because it points towards this individuality and this diversity of all these different ways that we can come to know the sacred or in, embody the sacred. And I also love it because it points towards the breath. And I belong to a Naqshbandi Sufi tradition and uh, one of our core principles is, is awareness of breath. Um, I think Bahá'u'lláh in Naqshband said the, the more we can be aware of the breath, the deeper is our inner life. And so there's something about the way um, the breath brings together the body and the spirit. And I think Fatima was pointing towards that in the um, guided meditation that she led earlier. And that this rhythm of, you know, 10,000 breaths a day, bringing, you know, together the physical dimension and this source, this invisible thing that actually gives us life. I think, um, so I think breathing and being conscious of our breath is a very powerful way to embody the sacred and um you know for us in our tradition we also link that breath to the name of god so we do a um a vicar that involves uh silently repeating the name of allah on the breath al on the in breath and la on the out breath and so over the years of doing this practice one's breath becomes intimately connected with the name of god and becomes an intimate um remembrance so, but I think, you know, whether or not you do that practice, I think the breath still has this power. And, you know, I, I, I notice in my life, if, if I'm having a moment of closeness with a friend, for example, if I, if I then bring my attention to my breath, then something becomes present between us or something deepens. You know, or if one is walking in the forest or in the, on the streets of Oxford Street, you know, breathing into the earth it can be a very powerful practice that um, recreates these bonds of divine kinship with our physical environment, with the earth beneath our feet. And that can be a very moving practice. And I'm also <laughs> on the subject of breath. I'm also a major fan of conscious cleaning. And, you know, conscious cleaning to me is is a way that you can. Oh, Fatima's into conscious cleaning too. Awesome. Um, that you can, as you clean with the intention to purify both your inner landscape as well as the, the physical world and to breathe the love of God into everything that you touch. And, you know, so you're re-sacralizing your, or you're honoring the, the sacredness in, your, in the physical world of your home. And you're also purifying yourself at the same time. And um, I was I had a run of weekends away recently. I was away for five weekends in a row working and do, doing different things. And last weekend I had the absolute pleasure of just hanging out in my own home. And I spent a couple of days, you know, switched my mobile off and um, just spent two days just cleaning and decluttering and being with my garden and meditating and praying and just weaving all of those things together. And I could feel how my home and my garden were just drinking in this love that I was giving them. And at the end of this two days of basically just cleaning, um, but with this attitude and this intention, it just felt as if everything was restored. Everything in me was in the right place and everything in the world was in the right place and that my home and my garden were, were singing again. So I'm really a fan of that practice. Um, and I think, you know, there's something about uh the rhythm of one's life and and how one can use ritual and I, one of my colleagues becca she talks about the the rhythms of resilience um meaning the the architecture of practices and rituals that one can create in one's everyday life whether it's about having you know five prayers a day or or morning practices and evening practices and practices around how you eat and practices with nature and you know practices that relate to the cycles of life whether it's the seasons or different festivals or the moon you know but this architecture one can build um, of ritual and practice some of it alone and some of it with other people that that creates a, you know a, a way of of staying rooted in what's real and i think you know the world is becoming quite chaotic and toxic and i think it's really helpful to have this you know space to come back to where something else is present and where some of that toxicity and 
chaos is actually kept at bay so you have this protected space that you can that can support you to stay in touch with what is real and true and divine um, and having said that i think it's also it's also great not to get attached to one's habits and i think it's also really important to just you know rip up the plan and follow one's heart and be utterly spontaneous sometimes as well so I love that phrase, rhythms of resilience. Um, and I think there's something about, you know, the, the deepest way for us to know, to embody the sacred is to be, to be conscious of the fact that everything is divine in its origin, that everything is an expression of the divine and everything is sacred. And that that remembrance of, uh, this, I don't know where this phrase comes from, but Hamotus, like everything is he, everything is an expression of the one. Um, and that this, it, that, that awareness and that remembrance alone is enough to, to sacralize our experience of life in this deep and fundamental and profound way. And, and that makes me think that actually, you know, in a way that because everything is sacred, you know, the question really in a way ought to be what is it that um, prevents us from experiencing that or what is it that fools us into thinking that that's not the case so that we then have to ask these questions about how one embodies the sacred and of course that thing is is the ego and like the ego is this you know has a purpose it's there for a reason um, and it fools us into thinking that we're separate from each other and separate from creation and separate from God but actually that's just a divine joke you know and it's an illusion and if we get too caught in the belief of that being real then that separates us from the experience of life as sacred so really the I think the trick is to remember that the ego is a divine joke and that actually everything is is a sacred expression of the divine and this, um, the second part of the question about safe spaces, creating safe spaces, I think, I think this is a really important question. And, you know, my feeling about, you know, the end of this era and the attempt to begin this new era and this kind of slightly dark space that we're existing in between, you know, and I, know, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, the end of the Roman Empire and the Dark Ages and making this parallel between that and so there you know there is although there are these incredible seeds of a different future that are present you know present in this zoom room and present in lots of places there is this all you know different way to be that's coming to life there is also at the same time this regression going on into something quite tribal and you know i i see things getting harder for women as a result of that regression and i think you know, you, you may have people have different views about this, but the the abortion laws in in the in the states becoming much stricter or the kind of, you know, needle needle stuff in nightclubs, date rape stuff that women are talking about now. It's like, you know, these are expressions of this um, degen degeneration in our culture. And I and I I'm scared that things will get worse for women. Um, and I do think it's really important that we perhaps notice, notice the danger that we're in, notice the dangers that are around us and actually really honor and protect each other and stand up for each other, but not in a way that's in opposition to the masculine. Because if, if we blame or reject the masculine, then we're part of the problem rather than the solution. It has to be in relationship with the masculine, in relationship with men and in reconciliation with men. And I think that's really important because I think it would be very easy for women to notice those things and react against them and, and go into deeper into this war. And I think the other thing that that points towards is that when we talk about safe space, that really the the safe space or or one aspect of the safe space is is inside us and how we make that safe space within us in relation to to gender is by integrating the masculine and the feminine within us 
And, you know, many women are scared of men, have had experiences that have led them to be scared of men. But if one in integrates the masculine inside oneself, then that fear goes, you know, and then one has um, an aspect of one's psyche which can, can create boundaries that can protect you, that can and send out a different message to the world, you know, that possibly could help you navigate through some of those dangers. So I do think that, that we create safe, safe space within ourselves by integrating the masculine and the feminine inside us. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Thank you so much um, for bringing us back to the breath. You know, it's such a, such a simple thing and yet so incredibly powerful. Um, and, and I know for a lot of people that don't come from a meditation background or, or, or a spiritual, you know, a secular meditation background or a spiritual background, it's always just a case of, I'm just going to skip this bit, you know, and then come back to the, to the intellectual chatty bits. Um, but I think the more that we're exposed to these practices of the breath, the more I think we found, you know, in our journey um, with Ray and beyond, is that that's what helps us to enter the sacred space and to hold the sacred space. And then the more other hearts are able to step into that, it really start to feel that it's one breath that's being breathed and it's coming through the earth, you know, as you were saying about, you know, kind of connecting down as well. So yeah, thank you so much for bringing us back to that. Um, Naima, would you like to speak to the same question? Uh, yeah, th thank you for mentioning the breath, Justine. I think that's something that is so easily implemented, actually, so, and it can be so immediately implemented. Um, so yeah, I, I, when, I, when I was looking at this question, I was thinking about the 99 names of all last one, Atala, because that is something that I lean on a lot in my, uh, understand, my theology. Um, and to understand that masculine and feminine are contained within Allah and then also, therefore also contained within ourselves has been really useful to me um, and that those qualities are sacred and that I, I, I can be a vessel for those qualities on earth um, has also been a way for me to embody the sacred or to think about the way that the sacred is within me and my actions and my attitudes and my presence. Um, and I think that part of that also means reckoning with, not just as, you know, Justine mentioned, um, how did you put it? You talked about noticing the dangers that we're in. I think also if we recognize that we embody the sacred qualities of all that, then we also have to recognize the dangers we can do and the ways that we can also be perpetrators of harm to one another. And that that then I think links directly to the second part of the question, which is, about helping to create safer spaces, um, especially for female bodies. Part of that has to be to recognize the way that we, our physical presence um, changes things for people who don't have that same physicality, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I would like, when, when I when thinking about how that applies to me, an example would be like, I'm a light skinned South Asian person, the way that I can withdraw resources from and erase black women are multiple and actually very easy for me to do. Um, if I'm not conscious of not doing that harm, the likelihood is I'm probably doing that harm. So there's an element of that, of that responsibility on me to embody the sacred and create more safe spaces by at a minimum recognizing that and then working actively to end the perpetuation of that harm by resourcing people whom my presence might withdraw resources from. Um, and I think it's relevant to everybody here, you know, especially to white Muslim women. I think um, reckoning with white supremacy is incumbent upon you. And um, for those of us who are not disabled, reckoning with the way that our needs are met and our desires are met compared to women who are disabled. I think that that, that in you know, our attempts to embody the sacred also means we have to think about the way that that plays out in those situations and I particularly think this at this time and we, we talked about COP26 a bit we really have to recognize how those of us with passports and nationalities confirmed how that plays out in the world and how that interacts with people who have insecure immigration status 
and who will who already are or who will become climate change refugees um, and that is a way that we can embody the sacred and create safer spaces for female bodies for anybody to be able to access safety and stability is we have to recognize our ability to do harm and stop doing it um, I think that is to me a big a big part of embodying the sacred and and we did you know I've talked a lot about stop let's stop doing harm but also let's recognize all of the strength and the sacred qualities that remind us you have within you mercy you have within you care you have within you knowledge you have within you love all of these things that then go towards healing repair and that the reduction of harm has to also be done with those things in mind um with those qualities activated um that that's kind of what i was thinking about when i was thinking about embodying the sacred Thank you so much, Naima. Um, you've made me think again about um, Dr. Saadia Sheikh because her book is just so recent in my mind. You know, this idea of harm that she says that, that if we just approach the Jalal qualities of God without having done the work, then that can create great harm because we haven't really integrated it and we don't really understand the power of it. Whereas uh, starting with the Jamal, the beautiful receptive qualities, it's a way of prepping us and opening us up to then really understanding what is it that the Jalal names are asking of us and then how do we embody those in the world. And a lot of that is around justice, truth, power, um, but then to be in balance with, the, with all the names and all the names that are within, within us that make up our being, um, our journey through the world. But thank you so much for bringing it back to the, the divine names. It's always one of our favorites. Leila Chan, would you like to speak to the same question? Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the second part of the question because that is the, the harder part for me, I have to admit, because the, the, the words in there um, trigger certain feelings and thoughts in me and um i don't mean in the way you know not in that way that i'm i'm triggered on a, on a harmful level but just that i have um yeah quite strong responses to her to that because the the wording safe spaces especially for female bodies immediately reminds me of that whole uh debate that you have had very strongly in the UK recently, we now have it in Germany as well, that there is a branch of feminism uh, that says trans women should not enter uh, female spaces because it makes, tr because trans women are not actually women and it makes women, real women feel unsafe. And that has been a very ugly discussion. It has been a very painful discussion um I, I guess a lot of you have uh have followed it partly you know all the the drama surrounding jackie rowling we we actually had an internal discussion uh, with the rayfest team on this um and yeah when whenever when i read that kind of wording uh then i that's immediately what's present for me i think uh, gosh you know, and there you also see that talking about safe spaces for some people can sometimes also mean producing harm for other people. And that's why I found uh, Naima's point also very important there. Um, this we, we need more mindfulness about that. Uh, whoever we are, whatever our identities are, um, most people uh, that we interact with in spaces like this um, of a certain level, most of us will carry privileges, but at the same time also may face marginalizations and we constantly need to negotiate that. You know, how can, how can I make sure that people who feel marginalized in some way feel safe, but at the same time, people who feel marginalized in other ways do not suddenly feel unsafe through that. Um, and uh, it's also a larger discussion, this whole safe space terminology or safer space, which I like actually more that Naima brought up because it's it's an important 
it's an important thing to have safe spaces or safer spaces, but I, I also have seen in activist spaces that the, this, this phrase has sometimes been instrumentalized to hurt people or harm people or to deny people their, their own identity, you know, uh, or because whenever you create a safe space, you have to define who belongs to it, who doesn't. When I create a safe space for women, do trans women belong or not? When I create a safe space uh, for people of color, uh, how, how visible does your people of color status have to be? Uh, when I create a safe space for black people, what does it, does it mean for light-skinned black people and so on? It's always complicated to do that. And we have to be more mindful about not definitely not reproducing harm in those moments as well. Um, and uh, yeah, also thank you so much, Naima, for bringing up the issue of uh, climate change refugees, because that's something that's going through my mind a lot these days as well. And what I immediately always think in that context is that right now we already are in a situation where female refugees are much more vulnerable in much more difficult situations than uh, male refugees but also LGBTQI refugees are much more vulnerable, are in much more difficult situations than those refugees who are not LGBTQI. There is a lot of violence happening uh, at, at the border regimes uh, that's affecting all refugees, but it's particularly ref um, affecting women and it's particularly affecting sexual minorities. Um, and, um, yeah, with, with, with climate change, we just know that this will get worse. You know, this is what, what we, what is constantly framed as a crisis right now is not actually a crisis. You know, like, like the number of people coming in Europe could handle this, it, for example. And the UK hasn't even actually taken many people in at all, you know, so that, that's not even big but it is going to grow it is going to be a problem there will be whole countries that will become uninhabitable at some point soon that maybe i will still see in my lifetime and i really i worry about all the human lives there but i in particular worry about the women and the sexual minorities there and we have to make that visible as early and as strongly as possible so that we can create strategies um and and also pressure our own societies to make sure we, we cannot go on with these border regimes we cannot go on it's not sustainable it's not sustainable for the world it's also not sustainable for our own societies because what kind of existence is this going to be just build higher walls and put more people with machine guns there is that who we want to be and what how will that affect our societies as well it's not something we can allow to happen but it is going to happen the way the world is is going these days and we we need to we need to put pressure on that that is and now i'm going to use that word that is a sacred duty definitely um so that was the really the harder part i'm going to say a few <laughs> things to the more easier part of the for the the first question um, I'm very much there with Justine. I love the, the sanctifying of everyday life. And I find it very sad that in modern Islam, this, these, the spaces for that become smaller and smaller and smaller. You have a certain richness still in Sufi traditions. You have in, in Shia Islam, you have also, um, a, you have space for that. But in, in the kind of, you know, that set of Salafi, Wahhabi, Ikhwani, uh, what Islam, all these modern essentializing movements, they don't have much space for that, you know, while in, you know, in, in traditional, for example, South Asian Sufi context, you have so many festivals, so many commemorations, the birthday of the Prophet, you have the celebration of Abdul Qadir Jilani, you have the Urs of this saint, of that saint, you know, so, so the whole, the whole year has these sacred moments in time and in Shia Islam as well, all of the Imams are celebrated, uh, the women of the household of the Prophet, the birthday of Fatima. 
the, the passing away of Fatima, for example, it's all recognized and celebrated. And you don't have that in modern mainstream Islam anymore. It's dying out. Um, also, it's so sad because we are a religion, for example, that has a, an importance uh, a focus on the cycle of the moon. Our months are structured according to that. And that used to be celebrated a lot as well, like in, in uh, traditional South Asian Islam, each new moon was celebrated. Uh, and now we don't do that anymore. And even the celebrations of the new moon of Ramadan, it becomes less and less significant because we, you know, it's not ritualized anymore. In the past, families would go outside, the children would try to spot uh, seeing the new moon. There would be a prayer when the new moon is sighted, these kind of things. And now you just look up online, oh, was the moon sighted or not? And then you can debate, you can argue with others whether that's correct or not, you know? But, we're losing that kind of uh, sanctification, uh, the, the sacredness of, of everyday life and of these cycles. And some of us may be able to continue the traditional um, ways of doing that, but even those who cannot, I would invite them to create their own rituals around these cycles. You know, think about, could, could you memory? Could you, could you commemorate a new moon, for example? Um, or how do you, how do you um, experience different months, bo both of the solar year or, or uh, the lunar year? Um, it's a very, bu very beautiful thing to, to have these, uh, these moments in time. Also, weekly, Thursday evening, Traditionally, is always the evening for zikr. When you are in traditional Muslim context, is often the time when you would use, uh, you know, incense, also to purify the air in your home and to clean up. Also, conscious cleaning. Conscious cleaning is actually something that has been done by traditional Muslim communities as well. You would do that on on a day like Thursday, for example. Um, and yeah, I, I I love these practices and I. I hope we can bring them back or enliven them again in in our modern religiosity and modern spirituality. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. Um, um, before I comment, I'm just going to share because people have been asking the name of the book that I keep referencing, so that's just been put into chat. Um, thank you, Leila, for bringing up this idea of safe space because it's not a fixed thing right it's not like we've achieved space safe space and that's it and, and i'm really grateful that you brought that up because i remember at some point during this year thinking um wanting to be a bit more intentional about describing that and it's this idea of we're trying to create safer spaces and i think it's such a subtle distinction and yet really important because safer spaces it feels more active you know, like where it's constantly happening, we're constantly trying to understand and work with each other. And I think that's the beauty of creating spaces and gatherings like this with like minded people, because we're all learning in every interaction that we have, you know, well, what, what was the, the rub there? What was it that I was feeling and what, that I wasn't understanding and that I need to be more conscious of? And to me, this whole aspect has helped me understand, well, what is what does safety mean to me and it's very different to how other people would would you know approach it so i think thank you for reminding me about that and i think Fatima and i will maybe spend a bit of time just rewording um how we take that forward moon wars yes let's let's not get started on moon wars um but <laughs> but what i wanted to say was that one of the things that came out of the festival last year was this deeper awareness of the moon um, something that I know that a lot of a lot of people, um, not just women, have become more conscious of. And last year's festival was held on on a blue moon, on a blue full moon, over the Halloween weekend. And we made the intention to have a year's worth of gatherings on the full moon. And so we've got two more left. We've got November and December, and it's been so beautiful to have that awareness. And because I know when the full moon is going to be because of the dates in my diary and we're preparing for it, 
then I'm also more aware of the new moon and being connected to all the different traditions that speak about these times in different ways and developing the relationship with not just the moon and the earth, but the entire cosmos and how our bodies are reacting and constantly in a state of relationship with everything that's going on around us. So thank you so much for that. And then you, know, you brought up uh, the climate. So I think this connects very beautifully to our third question, which is how can we embrace our connection to the earth and to our bodies to help create a deeper connection to the divine? And I'm going to ask Justine if she would start us off again. Thanks, Saima. Um, well, I'm, a, I'm aware that we've um, talked for quite a long time as a panel and there might be a need for time for questions. And I can talk about this topic like till the cows come home. Um, so if, if I talk for more than five minutes, maybe you can just give me a wave and I'll, I'll wrap up. Otherwise, we won't have time for questions. Um, super important question. Um, it just feels like how we uh, learn to connect with um, Earth the sacred is just one of the key practices of our, of our time. Um, and I was very influenced by indigenous traditions who often teach about the need to have a sit spot, you know, somewhere in nature that you just go and you sit there for a period of time every day. Um, and I guess I developed my own, but it's more of a kind of movement spot than an actual sitting still spot. And I was taught a, a practice called Dong Sticks, which is a Qigong practice. Um, that involves a big stick, strangely enough. Um, and I was taught it by Satish Kumar's wife, June Peters, um, and about six years ago. And I started doing it in my garden in the morning and found that because I started in the winter, I was, I was naturally outside when it was dark and doing this practice as the, the first light came. And so it, was, it became a very magical thing. And the practice, in, it's just a series of movements, but I built into those movements um, different prayers, different ways of greeting the different kingdoms of life, you know, the, the rooted ones and the winged ones and the, the underground ones and all of these different, and the four-legged ones, all of these different kingdoms of life and built in different prayers that went with each of the movements. Um, and so it became a, a really lovely thing for me. And I think the first thing that I noticed was that I would just immediately feel this sense of peace that was actually much deeper than when I was praying or, or meditating and, and more distinct somehow. And, you know, the second thing I noticed was that you just become very aware of what's happening around you. You know, you notice which birds come to the garden first, you know, you, you learn which, which trees or which bushes different birds are, are nesting in, you know, you work out kind of what time the parakeet, the parakeet, this flock of parakeets come from my garden. They come from the southwest to the northeast at exactly the same time in relation to sunrise every morning, having their very loud conversation. And you know, you notice what time the squirrels wake up, which is actually quite late. They like a little bit of lie in. Um, and you just become very connected with all of these different aspects of this world that's happening, you know, outside of human awareness a lot of the time. So I found that a very magical and moving experience. And, you know, it kind of led me into this sense of communion. And I think one of the things that's really important when we do these practices with the earth is, is, to, is to empty ourselves because we can go into those spaces wanting something for ourselves um, and also thinking our thoughts you know, and human beings are so used to seeing themselves as the center of everything. And so going into this practice, thinking about yourself in the normal anthropocentric, human centered, self centered way, you know, nothing really happens. One has to learn how to empty oneself and leave that behind. And, you know, I find there's always this, this moment where suddenly oneself is not present. There is your you're stepping back into, into this circle of life where you know, the whole of the rest of creation is talking to you know, itself and singing to itself and in communion with itself. And it's only human beings that are outside that, but we can learn how to, to step back in. And I guess it's a process of making ourselves deeply native to the place where we are or the place where we belong and becoming very stepping into this deep sense of community with place and a community which is beyond the human community. 
so for me that's been a very transformative practice and I was also very influenced by um, the animal communication movement. I was um, taught at one point by Anna Breitenbach, the South African animal communicator. And this to me was an absolute revelation that, you know, she has these very simple techniques that teach you how to talk to animals. And, you know, actually they can talk back. And when I first started practicing this, it absolutely blew my mind. You know, for about three years, I was having these, you know, little but mind blowing experiences with animals thank you thank you very much animals and plants and it took me you know it took me a good three or four years to actually integrate that so you so it was no longer this sense of like oh my god this is just like absolutely mind-blowing but actually this is just what life is and what life does and human beings have have lost that way of being and that we can actually relearn it and then we can be part of this thing that thomas berry the Christian spiritual ecologist called the great conversation, which is just happening all the time around us. So for me, this is, you know, these things are an absolute joy and delight and mind blowing source of magic and amazingness and depth and fulfillment, you know, but they are also what's most needed at this point in history, because we are at risk of losing this sacred bond between the creator and the creation. And that every time we we come with this humility and this awareness and this uh, seeking to serve in that relationship with Earth rather than to take, we're helping to restore that sacred bond and and actually the future of humanity and many many other species on this Earth and the Earth itself is really dependent on on that. So it couldn't be a more important question. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Justine. I'm just going to move forward and ask uh, Naima if she has anything to share about that. Yeah, thank you. I think my comments are going to build a little bit on what Justine mentioned, um, because for, for me, this question came down to, I think I need to, and I would encourage my community as well, to look into the earth as we would look into theology. Um, so think of it as a source of knowledge. Um, reflecting very much what Justine just said and I think I mentioned to Simon Fatima at our, in our initial discussions about this event that um, is it, something that I experienced in America really helped me to reconcile a lot of the bits of Allah that I found very disparate and difficult to come together I was struggling with the oneness of God and um, I was in America at a indigenous museum and they there was an exhibition about the earth and the earth being a source of provision and mercy um, through things like shade and fruits and just you know the, the the wonderful things that the earth gives us, but also a source of destruction and death and humiliation and um, through things like earthquakes and flooding and tsunamis and how that is be beyond our control in in many ways. Um, even even without climate change it's sort of we are at the mercy of the earth in many ways and it is both a provider and um something that can withdraw our sources um but that that indigenous concept of oneness really helped me to to understand an islamic understanding of oneness and it was very much rooted in our, our understanding and observations of the earth which makes me feel like just to bring justine's point home that if we do that, what she suggested about observing the earth, observing the patterns, exploring it and, and integrating it, that theological approach with the scientific approach where you know, science is just a method, a methodological exploration for greater and greater knowledge of what we already have, understanding things better and deeper than what we already do. That's very compatible with the theological speaking of knowledge. Um, and I think the earth is a source for that. And I think if we did that, we'd, we'd be able to create that deeper connection to the divine. And we'd also be reckon, reckoning with quite difficult political stuff that we need to understand and grapple with, such as land ownership and land justice and who has the right to build on land and claim it for themselves and put borders around it. And who has been systemically, hist you know, from centuries ago and continuing up into now who has been blocked from owning and 
securing land and stability for themselves. And I think if we seek that deeper connection to the divine, we also have to connect with the way that humans are grappling with the earth and modifying it in a way. Um, I'll stop and we can go to Naima. Thank you, Naima. Leela Jan, please do go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Wow, so much to think about. Uh, again, uh, just seeing what you said about the, the parakeets, it, it reminded me of my experience of, um, especially in, in late spring, early summer, when I manage, I have to say I manage, I'm, I'm not that pious that I do all my five prayers all the time, but when I manage to get up for Fajr prayer, it's the most beautiful thing, this experience of, of hearing the birds sing at that precise moment, and you have this this feeling that the whole world, the whole cosmos is also praying and is also doing something. And then I also always notice that there's a particular bird. I don't know what bird it is, but but at the place where I live is precisely, you know, when my when my prayer uh, uh, schedule says it's sundown precisely in that moment always i i hear that bird making a specific sound it's i find this very very interesting how much you know life on this planet is also tuned to all these rhythms um yeah now that naima brought up this issue of thinking about the earth in, in a way how we the earth and theology um i was thinking of, of i mean this is also such a common tradition that we have in Islam and in Judaism and Christianity. And as modern human beings, we have as much issues with it as with physical resurrection. But this idea that we were created from Earth, you know, this is this is a very central um, part of our our religious mythology. And we do not because we find it too to you know not very much in in sync with our current um scientific knowledge and uh, a lot of other things we we do not really think of the significance of of that thought actually what a beautiful thought that is and it also it in effect also means establishing a relationship um and there actually is another hadith and it's uh, Ibn Arabi writes a lot about that hadith that says, um, respect the date palm because the date palm is your aunt. Because when God created uh, the first human being from, from earth, from clay, there was some, some surplus, uh, there was something, you know, a little rest left. And then God created the date palm out of it. And that's such an amazing thought uh, that that we we could think of of trees as our relatives, and in in effect, we should think of all beings as our relatives. And uh, we, of course, we do not have to do this through religious myth. We can also do this through the idea of evolution, and but make this a bit more, you know, like a more tangible reality in our lives that we really we go out we uh, we take a walk in the forest and we reflect on that that we are not only um a human family that is treating our human relatives very badly for example through issues such as land ownership and i was just also thinking that this idea of nation states and border regimes is also actually an issue of land ownership in in essence um yeah but we're also a family that for, forgets our our relatives all around us that the plants that we are related to the animal life that we are related to this whole beautiful existence that's all related to us yeah. i'm going to stop there as well thank you Thank you so much, Leila Jan. Um, yeah, absolutely. I just so many beauties in what you just shared. Um, I have opened up uh, the chat, and I think you know if, if friends want to share any reflections, if you have any questions, time has got away with us. Um, but um, one thing that I was really struck by, and I just thought maybe if anybody wanted to speak to it, this idea of being connected to the earth, not just in terms of our ancestral lineage of where we've come from um 
a lot of us are come, you know, our parents are come from different different countries, our grandparents. But Fatima and I have been really feeling into this idea of where are we now? Where have we ended up? What is the land that we're that we're on at the moment? And I know that um, when I've dialed into American uh, gatherings, there's it, they're usually open with a uh, a statement, a recognition of what the land is that they're on, where it where who it used to belong to. And I just feel that there seems to be something really important in this idea of looking at where we are individually and using that as a way to reconnect the divine, the actual space that we're occupying. And I think, you know, Daniel and I are quite lucky that we live in the beautiful Lake District, you know, which used to be a Celtic kingdom. Um, and there's so much richness and heritage in looking back at those traditions and finding the resonances between whichever spiritual tradition that we might embody. And I wonder if that's something that any of you might feel into or have something to share about. Um, please do feel free, anybody who wishes to speak. I wonder if we can pose a question to the, the audience, this question in the chat about how do you embrace your connection to the earth um, and to your bodies? Um, and does that help you to create a deeper connection to the divine? Yeah, absolutely. So that I'll I'll reshare the question in chat. If anybody wishes to answer it, either in chat or if you'd like to speak. So Alia shared the link to nativeland.ca. Ali, do you have anything more to share about the link? Thank you. <clears throat> Salam alaikum, everyone. Um, the link I shared is one, it's a uh, knowledge gathering about the original land uh, of the people from, you know, ancient times or when we knew we were people, we, you know, we named ourselves. So, and, and it's an experiment. And if you, you know, they're always gathering more feedback about um, making that knowledge base sound and um, complete. So I just, it's one that we use at my work in the Nature Conservancy a lot. So I just thought I'd share it here if anybody's interested. And I really want to thank the panelists and uh, for what you talked about embodying um, I related to almost all of it, and I love the times in nature when I realize that that same bird sings every day at that exact moment, or like I can, I can, since lockdown, I've been able to recognize the individual birds that live around my house and like when they sing and when they don't. And it's just so beautiful and subtle. And we have in our Sufi tradition, this um, practice of Gurushmek, which is to be, to see and be seen. It's a, like, it's like a mirror, like seeing each other um, eye to eye or witnessing the presence of each other. And I, you, when you were all speaking, I just realized how much I, I think I'm, I'm alone seeing these things, like, or hearing or noticing, but while you were speaking, I just really realized that I'm also being seen, like, this bird can see me too, or the moon is seeing me too, every, you know, we're all here together, I hope we all, and um, open our cameras <laughs> to, I know I didn't last year, so I'm not saying anything if anybody wants to um, stay off camera, but it's like that mutual seeing. And I think like really when that happens or when you're conscious of it, it just, it just really does help me be embodied because I'm, I'm being recognized and seen just like I'm seeing someone else. So it's just a really subtle but profound beauty and I, I appreciate all of the contributors and the question. Uh, so thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Alia Jan. What a beautiful way to, I think, bring this uh, wonderful session of Heart to Heart to completion. Thank you so much, Naima, Justine, and Leila. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you. As always, not enough time, um, but um, hopefully we can we can have future gatherings where we can have you all be present with us. Thank you so much. Can I just jump in and say thank you so much, Alia? That was especially the last bit you said has really made me think. It just it just really really needed to be said in the current climate where. Um, yeah, I think for, for, for introverts like me anyway, what you said is very profound. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Naima Jan.